Something, somewhere, somewhen, must have happened differently. Petunia Evans married Michael Varis, a professor of biochemistry at Oxford. Harry James Potter Evans Varis grew up in a house filled to the brim with books. He once bit a math teacher who didn't know what a logarithm was. He's read Gödel, Escher, Bach, and Judgment Under Uncertainty, Heuristics and Biases, and Volume 1 of the Feynman Lectures on Physics. And despite what everyone who's met him seems to fear, he doesn't want to become the next Dark Lord. He was raised better than that. He wants to discover the laws of magic and become a god. Hermione Granger is doing better than him in every class, except broomstick riding. Draco Malfoy is exactly what you would expect an 11-year-old boy to be like if Darth Vader were his doting father. Professor Quirrell is living his lifelong dream of teaching defense against the dark arts, or as he prefers to call his class, battle magic. His students are all wondering what's going to go wrong with the defense professor this time. Dumbledore is either insane or playing some vastly deeper game which involves setting fire to a chicken. Deputy Headmistress Minerva McGonagall needs to go off somewhere private and scream for a while. Presenting Harry Potter and the Methods of Rationality. You ain't guessing where this one's going. One of the many, many unused rooms of Hogwarts. That was where future historians would one day record, if the whole project ever actually amounted to anything, the scientific study of magic had begun with two young first-year Hogwarts students. Harry James Potter Evans Varis, theorist, and Hermione Jean Granger, experimenter and test subject. It should be mentioned at this point that the bats flying around the room were not glowing. Harry was having trouble accepting the implications of this. Oogelly, boogelly. Again, at the tip of Hermione's wand, there was the abrupt, transitionless appearance of a bat. And it still wasn't glowing. Can I stop now? Are you sure that maybe with a bit more practice you couldn't get it to glow? He was violating the experimental procedure he'd written down beforehand, which was a sin. And he was violating it because he didn't like the results he was getting, which was a mortal sin. You could go to science hell for that. But it didn't seem to be mattering anyway. What did you change this time? The durations of the oo, eh, and e sounds. It's supposed to be three to two to two, not three to one to one. Oogly boogly. The bat materialized with only one wing and spun pathetically to the floor. Now what is it really? Three to two to one. Oogly boogly. This time, the bat didn't have any wings at all and fell with a plop like a dead mouse. Three to one to two. And lo, the bat did materialize and it did fly up at once towards the ceiling, healthy and glowing a bright green. Hermione nodded in satisfaction. There was a long pause. Seriously? You seriously have to say oogly boogly with the duration of the oo, eh, and e sounds having a ratio of three to one to two, or the bat won't glow? Why? Why? For the love of all that is sacred, why? Why not? Arrgh! Harry was doing better in classes now, at least the classes he considered interesting. The books were full of complicated instructions for all the things you had to do exactly right in order to cast a spell. Harry had thought about the nature of magic for a while, and then designed a series of experiments based on the premise that virtually everything wizards believed about magic was wrong. You couldn't really need to say Wingardium Leviosa in exactly the right way in order to levitate something, because, come on, Wingardium Leviosa? The universe was going to check that you said Wingardium Leviosa in exactly the right way, and otherwise it wouldn't make the quill float? No. Obviously no, once you thought about it seriously. Someone, quite possibly an actual preschool child, but at any rate, some English-speaking magic user who thought that Wingardium Leviosa sounded all flyish and floaty had originally spoken those words while casting the spell for the first time. And, Harry had hypothesized, the process of obeying those instructions, of checking that you were following them correctly, probably did do something. It forced you to concentrate on the spell. Being told to just wave your wand and wish probably wouldn't work as well. And once you believed the spell was supposed to work a certain way, 
Once you had practiced it that way, you might not be able to convince yourself that it could work any other way. But what if you didn't know what the original spell had been like? What if you gave Hermione a list of spells she hadn't studied yet, taken from a book of silly prank spells in the Hogwarts library, and some of those spells had the correct and original instructions, while others had one changed gesture, one changed word? Well, in that case, it had turned out... Harry was having trouble believing his results here. It seemed the universe actually did want you to say Wingardium Leviosa, and it wanted you to say it in a certain exact way, and it didn't care what you thought the pronunciation should be any more than it cared how you felt about gravity. Why? The worst part of it was the smug, amused look on Hermione's face. Hermione had not been okay with sitting around obediently following Harry's instructions without being told why. So, Harry had explained to her what they were testing. Harry had explained why they were testing it. Harry had explained why probably no wizard had tried it before them. Harry had explained that he was actually fairly confident in his prediction. Because, Harry had said, there was no way that the universe actually wanted you to say Wingardium Leviosa. Hermione had pointed out that this was not what her book said. Hermione had asked if Harry really thought he was smarter at 11 years old and just over a month into his Hogwarts education than all the other wizards in the world who disagreed with him. Harry had said the following exact words. Of course! Say it. I wasn't going to. It didn't seem nice. Just get it over with. Okay, so you gave me this whole long lecture about how hard it was to do basic science and how we might need to stay on the problem for 35 years, and then you went and expected us to make the greatest discovery in the history of magic in the first hour we were working together. You didn't just hope, you really expected it. You're silly. I've read all the books you gave me, and I still don't know what to call that. Overconfidence? Planning fallacy? Super duper Lake Wobegon effect? They'll have to name it after you. Harry Bias. But it is cute. It's such a boy thing to do. Drop dead. Oh, you say the most romantic things. So, what's next? Nothing. I have to go back and design different experiments. Over the last month, Harry had carefully worked out, in advance, a course of experimentation for them that would have lasted until December. It would have been a great set of experiments if the very first test had not falsified the basic premise. Harry could not believe he had been this dumb. Let me correct myself. I need to design one new experiment. I'll let you know when we've got it, and we'll do it, and then I'll design the next one. How does that sound? It sounds like someone wasted a whole lot of effort. What did we discover today? I discovered that when it comes to doing truly basic research on a genuinely confusing problem where you have no clue what's going on, my books on scientific methodology aren't worth crap. Language, Mr. Potter. Some of us are innocent young girls. Fine. But if my books were worth a carp, that's a kind of fish, not anything bad, they would have given me the following important piece of advice. When there's a confusing problem and you're just starting out and you have a falsifiable hypothesis, go test it. Find some simple, easy way of doing a basic check and do it right away. Don't worry about designing an elaborate course of experiments that would make a grant proposal look impressive to a funding agency. Just check as fast as possible whether your ideas are false before you start investing huge amounts of effort into them. How does that sound for a moral? Mmm, okay. But I was also hoping for something like, Hermione's books aren't worthless. They're written by wise old wizards who know more about magic than I do. I should pay attention to what Hermione's books say. Can we have that moral too? Harry's jaw seemed to be clenched too tightly to let any words out, so he just nodded. Great! I like this experiment. We learned a lot from it, and it only took me an hour or so. Ah! It was the second meeting of the Bayesian Conspiracy. Draco Malfoy hadn't been sure if he should look forward to it or not. Harry Potter, judging by the expression on his face, didn't seem to have any doubts on the appropriate mood. Harry Potter looked like he was ready to kill someone. Hermione Granger, don't ask. He couldn't have gone on another date, could he? Harry... Did you really order the Mudblood Girl an expensive mokeskin pouch for her birthday? Yes, I did. You've already worked out why, of course. Draco reached up and raked fingers through his hair in frustration. He hadn't been quite sure why, but now he couldn't say so. Harry, people know I'm friends with you. They don't know about the conspiracy, of course, but they know we're friends, and it makes me look bad when you do that sort of thing. 
Anyone in Slytherin who can't understand the concept of acting nice toward people you don't actually like should be ground up and fed to pet snakes. There are a lot of people in Slytherin who don't. Most people are stupid, and you have to look good in front of them anyway. What do you care what other people think? Are you really going to live your life needing to explain everything you do to the dumbest idiots in Slytherin? I'm sorry, Draco, but I'm not lowering my cunning plots to the level of what the dumbest Slytherins can understand just because it might make you look bad otherwise. Not even your friendship is worth that. It would take all the fun out of life. Tell me you haven't ever thought the same thing when someone in Slytherin was being too stupid to breathe that it's beneath the dignity of a Malfoy to have to pander to them. Draco genuinely hadn't. Ever. Pandering to idiots was like breathing. You did it without thinking about it. Harry, just doing whatever you want without worrying about how it looks isn't smart. The Dark Lord worried about how he looked. He was feared and hated, and he knew exactly what sort of fear and hate he wanted to create. Everyone has to worry about what other people think. Perhaps. Remind me sometime to tell you about something called Ask's Conformity Experiment. You might find it quite amusing. For now, I'll just note that it's dangerous to worry about what other people think on instinct because you actually care, not as a matter of cold-blooded calculation. Remember, I was beaten and bullied by older Slytherins for 15 minutes, and afterwards I stood up and graciously forgave them, just like the good and virtuous boy who lived ought to do. But my cold-blooded calculations, Draco, tell me that I have no use for the dumbest idiots in Slytherin since I don't own a pet snake so I have no reason to care what they think about how I conduct my duel with Hermione Granger. She's just some mudblood. If you don't like her, push her down the stairs. Ravenclaw would know. Have Pansy Parkinson push her down the stairs. You wouldn't even have to manipulate her. Offer her a sickle and she'll do it. I would know. Hermione beat me in a book reading contest. She's getting better grades than me. I have to defeat her with my brain or it doesn't count. She's just a mudblood. Why do you respect her that much? She's a power among Ravenclaws. Why do you care what some powerless idiot in Slytherin thinks? It's called politics. And if you can't play it, you can't have power. Walking on the moon is power. Being a great wizard is power. There are kinds of power that don't require me to spend the rest of my life pandering to morons. Both of them stopped, and in almost perfect unison, began taking deep breaths to calm themselves. Sorry, Draco. You've got a lot of political power, and it makes sense for you to keep it. You should be calculating what Slytherin thinks. It's an important game, and I shouldn't have insulted it. But you can't ask me to lower the level of my game in Ravenclaw just so that you don't look bad by associating with me. Tell Slytherin you're gritting your teeth while you pretend to be my friend. That was exactly what Draco had told Slytherin, and he still wasn't sure whether it was true. Anyway, speaking of your image, I'm afraid I've got some bad news. Rita Skeeter heard some of the stories about you, and she's been asking questions. Who? She writes for the Daily Prophet. That's the newspaper people actually pay attention to. Rita Skeeter writes about celebrities, and as she puts it, uses her quill to puncture their overinflated reputations. If she can't find any rumors about you, she'll just make up her own. Draco hesitated before saying what he had to say next. By now, someone had certainly reported to Father that he was courting Harry Potter, and Father would also know that Draco hadn't written home about it, and Father would understand that Draco didn't think he could actually keep it a secret, which sent a clear message that Draco was practicing his own game now, but still on Father's side, since if Draco had been tempted away, he would have been sending false reports. It followed that Father had probably anticipated what Draco was about to say next. This isn't a suggestion. This isn't my advice. Just the way it is. My father could almost certainly quash that article. But it would cost you. I have no intention of trying to quash Rita Skeeter. You can't tell me that you don't care what the newspaper says about you. I care less than you might think, but I have my own ways of dealing with the likes of Skeeter. I don't need Lucius's help. A worried look came over Draco's face before he could stop it. Whatever Harry Potter was about to do next, it would be something Father wasn't expecting, and Draco was feeling very nervous about where that might lead. So, science, you're going to tell me about blood. We're going to find out about blood by doing experiments. All right, what sort of experiments? Harry Potter had asked how Draco would go about disproving the blood purist hypothesis, 
that wizards couldn't do the neat stuff now that they'd done eight centuries ago because they had interbred with Muggleborns and squibs. Draco had said he did not understand how Harry Potter could claim this was not a trap. Harry Potter had replied, still with a straight face, that if it was a trap, it would have been so pathetically obvious that he ought to be ground up and fed to pet snakes. But it was not a trap, it was simply a rule of how scientists operated that you had to try to disprove your own theories. And if you made an honest effort and failed, that was victory. Draco had tried to point out the staggering stupidity of this by suggesting that the key to surviving a duel was to cast Avada Kedavra on your own foot and miss. Harry Potter had nodded. Harry Potter had then presented the idea that scientists watched ideas fight to see which ones won, and you couldn't fight without an opponent, so Draco needed to figure out opponents for the blood purist hypothesis to fight so that blood purism could win, which Draco understood a little better even though Harry Potter had said it with a rather distasteful look. Harry Potter had then proceeded to claim that all the opponents Draco was inventing were too weak, so blood purism wouldn't get credit for defeating them because the battle wouldn't be impressive enough. Harry Potter had claimed that he himself just wanted to know how blood really worked, and for that he needed to see blood purism really win, and Draco wasn't going to fool him with theories that were just there to be knocked down. Even having seen the point, Draco hadn't been able to invent any plausible alternatives, as Harry Potter put it, to the idea that wizards were getting less powerful because they were mixing their blood with mud. It was too obviously true. It was then that Harry Potter had said, rather frustrated, that he couldn't imagine Draco was really this bad at considering different viewpoints. Surely there'd been Death Eaters who'd posed as enemies of blood purism and had come up with more plausible sounding arguments against their own side than Draco was offering. If Draco had been trying to pose as a member of Dumbledore's faction and come up with the House Elf hypothesis, he wouldn't have fooled anyone for a second. Draco had been forced to admit this was a point. Hence, the Potter Method. Draco was to pretend to be a Death Eater who was posing as the editor of a scientific journal, Dr. Malfoy, who wanted to reject his enemy Dr. Potter's paper on the heritability of magical ability. And if the Death Eater didn't act like a real scientist would, he would be revealed as a Death Eater and executed. While Dr. Malfoy was also being watched by his own rivals and needed to appear to reject Dr. Potter's paper for neutral scientific reasons or he would lose his position as journal editor. It was a wonder the sorting hat wasn't gibbering madly in St. Mungo's. Dr. Potter presented Dr. Malfoy with a piece of parchment on which was written, On the Heritability of Magical Ability, Dr. H. J. Potter Evans Veris, Institute for Sufficiently Advanced Science. My observation, today's wizards can't do things as impressive as what wizards used to do 800 years ago. My conclusion, wizard kind has become weaker by mixing their blood with muggleborns and squibs. Dr. Malfoy, I was wondering if the Journal of Irreproducible Results could consider for publication my paper entitled On the Heritability of Magical Ability. Draco looked at the parchment, smiling while he considered possible rejections. If he was a professor, he would have refused the essay as too short, so... It's too long, Dr. Potter. For a moment, there was genuine incredulity on Dr. Potter's face. Uh, how about if I get rid of the separate lines for observations and conclusions and just put in a therefore? Then it'll be too short. Next! You're getting too good at this. Two more times to practice, and then third time is for real. No interruptions between. I'll just come straight in at you, and that time you'll reject the paper based on the actual content. Remember, your scientific rivals are watching. Dr. Potter's next paper was perfect in every way, a marvel of its kind, but unfortunately had to be rejected because Dr. Malfoy's journal was having trouble with the letter E. Dr. Potter offered to rewrite it without those words, and Dr. Malfoy explained that it was really more of a vowel problem. The paper after that was rejected because it was Tuesday. It was, in fact, Saturday. Dr. Potter tried to point this out and was told, Next! This part was fun. He could have done this all day long. This is my latest paper, On the Heritability of Magical Ability. I have decided to allow your journal to publish it, and have prepared it in perfect accordance with your guidelines so that you may publish it quickly. The Death Eater decided to track down and kill Dr. Potter after his mission was done. Dr. Malfoy kept a polite smile on his face, since his rivals were watching, and said... You, ah, uh, need to consider other possible explanations for your, um, observation, besides just this one. 
Really? Like what, exactly? House elves are stealing our magic? My data admit of only one possible conclusion, Dr. Malfoy. There are no other plausible hypotheses. Draco was trying furiously to order his brain to think. What would he say if he was posing as a member of Dumbledore's faction? What did they claim was the explanation for Wizardkind's decline? Draco had never bothered to actually ask that. If you can't think of any other way to explain my data, you'll have to publish my paper, Dr. Malfoy. It was the sneer on Dr. Potter's face that did it. Oh yeah? How do you know that magic itself isn't fading away? Time stopped. Draco and Harry Potter exchanged looks of appalled horror. I didn't think of that! And I should have! The magic goes away! Damn, damn, damn! The alarm in Harry Potter's voice was contagious. He thought the House of Malfoy was safe. So long as you only married into families that could trace their bloodlines back four generations, you were supposed to be safe. It had never occurred to him before that there might be nothing anyone could do to stop the end of magic. Harry, what do we do? What do we do? We'll figure it out. If magic is fading out of the world, we'll figure out how fast it's fading and how much time we have left to do something. And then we'll figure out why it's fading, and then we'll do something about it. Draco, have wizarding powers been declining at a steady rate, or have there been sudden drops? I... I don't know. You told me that no one has matched the four founders of Hogwarts, so it's been going on for at least eight centuries then? You can't remember hearing anything about the problem suddenly appearing five centuries ago, or anything like that? Draco was trying frantically to think. I always heard that nobody was as good as Merlin, and then after that, nobody was as good as the founders of Hogwarts. Alright, because three centuries ago is when Muggles started to not believe in magic, which I thought might have something to do with it. And about a century and a half ago was when Muggles started using a kind of technology that stops working around magic, and I was wondering if it might also go the other way around. It's the Muggles! Damn it! Weren't you even listening to yourself? It's been going on for eight centuries at least, and the Muggles weren't doing anything interesting then. We have to figure out the real truth. The Muggles might have something to do with this, but if they don't, and you go blaming everything on them, and that stops us from figuring out what's really going on, then one day you're going to wake up in the morning and find out that your wand is just a stick of wood. Draco's breath stopped in his throat. His father had often said, Our wands will break in our hands. In his speeches, but Draco had never really thought about what that meant. It wasn't going to happen to him, after all. And now, suddenly it seemed very real. Just a stick of wood. That could happen to everyone. There would be no more wizards. No more magic. Ever. Just muggles who had a few legends about what their ancestors had been able to do. Some of the muggles would be called Malfoy, and that would be all that was left of the name. For the first time in his life, Draco realized why there were Death Eaters. He'd always taken for granted that becoming a Death Eater was something you did when you grew up. Now, Draco understood. He knew why father and father's friends had sworn to give their lives to prevent the nightmare that was coming to pass. There were things you couldn't just stand by and watch happen. But what if it was going to happen anyway? What if all the sacrifices, all the friends they'd lost to Dumbledore, the family they'd lost, what if it had all been for nothing? But, but, it's too awful to believe that. Draco, let me introduce you to something I call the Litany of Tarski. It changes every time you use it. On this occasion, it runs like so. If magic is fading out of the world, I want to believe that magic is fading out of the world. If magic is not fading out of the world, I want not to believe that magic is fading out of the world. Let me not become attached to beliefs I may not want. If we're living in a world where magic is fading, that's what we have to believe. We have to know what's coming so we can stop it. Or in the very worst case, be prepared to do what we can in the time we have left. Not believing it won't stop it from happening. So the only question we have to ask is whether magic is actually fading. And if that's the world we live in, then that's what we want to believe. Litany of Gendlin. What's true is already so. Owning up to it doesn't make it worse. Remember, it might not be happening, and then you won't have to believe it either. First, we just want to know what's actually going on, which world we actually live in. Observation Wizardry isn't as powerful now as it was when Hogwarts was founded. Hypotheses 1. Magic itself is fading. 
2. Wizards are interbreeding with muggles and squibs. 3. Knowledge to cast powerful spells is being lost. 4. Wizards are eating the wrong foods as children, or something else besides blood is making them grow up weaker. 5. Muggle technology is interfering with magic. Since 800 years ago? 6. Stronger wizards are having fewer children. Draco equals only child? Check if three powerful wizards, Quarrel, Dumbledore, Dark Lord, had any children. Tests. Draco stared at the list in shock. He was suddenly realizing that he knew an awful lot of purebloods who were only children. Himself, Vincent, Gregory, practically everyone. The two most powerful wizards everyone talked about were Dumbledore and the Dark Lord, and neither had had any children, just like Harry had suspected. Now when you're dealing with a confusing problem and you have no idea what's going on, the smart thing to do is figure out some really simple tests, things you can look at right away. We need fast tests that distinguish between these hypotheses. Observations that would come out a different way for at least one of them compared to all the others. It's going to be really hard to distinguish between 2 and 6. It's in the blood either way. You're going to have to try and track the decline of wizardry and compare that to how many kids different wizards were having and measure the abilities of Muggleborns compared to pure bloods. Let's just lump 6 in with 2 and call them the blood hypothesis for now. 4 is unlikely because then everyone would notice a sudden drop when the wizard switched to new foods. It's hard to see what would have changed steadily over 800 years. 5 is unlikely for the same reason, no sudden drop. Muggles weren't doing anything 800 years back. 4 looks like 2, and 5 looks like 1 anyway. So mainly, we should be trying to distinguish between 1, 2, and 3. Magic is fading, blood is weakening, knowledge is disappearing. What test comes out differently depending on which of those is true? What could we see that would mean any one of these was false? I don't know! Why are you asking me? You're the scientist! Draco! I only know what muggle scientists know! You grew up in the wizarding world, I didn't! You know more magic than I do, and you know more about magic than I do, and you thought of this whole idea in the first place, so start thinking like a scientist and solve this! Draco swallowed hard and stared at the paper. Magic is fading. Wizards are interbreeding with muggles. Knowledge is being lost. What does the world look like if magic is fading? You know more about magic. You should be the one guessing, not me. Imagine you're telling a story about it. What happens in the story? Charms that used to work stop working. Wizards wake up and find their wands are sticks of wood. What does the world look like if wizarding blood gets weaker? People can't do things their ancestors could do. What does the world look like if knowledge is being lost? People don't know how to cast the charms in the first place. He stopped, surprised at himself. That's a test, isn't it? That's one. He wrote it down on the parchment under tests. A. Are there spells we know but can't cast? One or two. Or are the lost spells no longer known? Three. So, that distinguishes between one and two on the one hand, and three on the other hand. Now we need some way to distinguish between one and two. Magic fading, blood weakening. How could we tell the difference? What kind of charms did students use to cast in their first year at Hogwarts? If they used to be able to cast much more powerful charms, the blood was stronger. Or magic itself was stronger. We have to figure out some way of telling the difference. No, wait, that might still work. Suppose different spells use up different amounts of magical energy. Then, if the ambient magic weakened, the powerful spells would die first, but the spells everyone learns in their first year would stay the same. It's not a very good test. It's more about powerful wizardry being lost versus all wizardry being lost. Someone's blood could be too weak for powerful wizardry, but strong enough for the easy spells. Draco, do you know if more powerful wizards within a single era, like powerful wizards just from this century, are more powerful as children? If the Dark Lord had cast the cooling charm when he was 11, could he have frozen the whole room? I can't remember hearing anything about the Dark Lord, but I think Dumbledore is supposed to have done something amazing on his Transfiguration Owls in fifth year. I think other powerful wizards were good in Hogwarts too. They could just be studying hard. Still, if first year students learned the same spells and seemed about as powerful then as now, we could call that weak evidence favoring one over two. Wait, hold on. I have another test that might distinguish between one and two. It would take a while to explain, it uses some things that scientists know about blood and inheritance, but it's an easy question to ask. 
And if we combine my test and your test, and they both come out the same way, that's a strong hint at the answer. B. Did ancient first-year students cast the same sort of spells with the same power as now? Weak evidence for 1 over 2, but blood could still be losing powerful wizardry only. C. Additional test that distinguishes 1 and 2 using scientific knowledge of blood will explain later. Okay, we can at least try to tell the difference between 1 and 2 and 3, so let's go with this right away. We can figure out more tests after we do the ones we already have. Now it's going to look a little odd if Draco Malfoy and Harry Potter go around asking questions together, so here's my idea. You'll go through Hogwarts and find old portraits and ask them about what spells they learned to cast during their first years. They're portraits, so they won't know there's anything odd about Draco Malfoy doing that. I'll ask recent portraits and living people about spells we know but can't cast. No one will notice anything unusual if Harry Potter asks weird questions. And I'll have to do complicated research about forgotten spells, so I want you to be the one to gather the data I need for my own scientific question. It's a simple question, and you should be able to find the answer by asking portraits. You might want to write this down. Ready? Go ahead. Find portraits who knew a married squib couple. Don't make that face, Draco. It's important information. Just ask recent portraits who are Gryffindors or something. Find portraits who knew a married squib couple well enough to know the names of all their children. Write down the name of each child and whether that child was a wizard, a squib, or a muggle. If they don't know whether the child was a squib or a muggle, write down non-wizard. Write that down for every child the couple had. Don't leave any out. If the portrait only knows the name of the wizarding children, not the names of all the children, then don't write down any data from that couple. It's very important that you only bring me data from someone who knows all the children a squib couple had, well enough to know them all by name. Try to get at least 40 names total if you can, and if you have time for more, even better. Have you got all that? I've got it. But why? It has to do with one of the secrets of blood that scientists already discovered. I'll explain when you get back. Let's split up and meet back here in an hour. 6.22 p.m. that should be. Are we ready to go? Draco nodded decisively. It was all very rushed, but he'd long since been taught how to rush. Then go!